Hello, my name is Matt Harmon. I'm the stewardship manager here at Coffee, Coffee Creek Watershed Preserve in Chesterton, Indiana. Uh, I work for the nonprofit Coffee Creek Watershed Conservancy, which is the nonprofit that owns the 157 acre preserve here in Northwest Indiana. So, my job as the stewardship manager is to manage everything alive here at the preserve. So I manage everything from the vegetation, so the plants, to the animals that make their home here in the preserve. Um, so the deer, the birds, the um, uh, even down to the insects and, and the insects that live in the stream, for instance. So I could be doing anything from doing water quality surveying with uh, scientific instruments um, in, the, in the creek, or I could be doing assessments of the macroinvertebrates, so looking at what, what bugs are living inside the water to see how healthy the stream is. I could also be doing anything from uh, controlling invasive plant species, so um, making sure that the, the habitat is healthy for the wildlife to be able to live here. So my, my job is a wide ranging job. I also do, of course, outreach stuff, and I like to talk to people about what I do here and how I maintain the, the biodiversity of the preserve. So biodiversity meaning the, the, uh, the different plants and animals that, that make their home here. Um, so I really enjoy talking to people about what I do here as well. So. So spring ephemeral, of course, those flowers that emerge right up in the spring and they take advantage of all the sunlight on the forest floor this time of the year when all the leaves, uh, as you can see kind of behind me, none of the leaves are on those trees. So the canopy is very open so the sun can actually reach the ground. So one of the really cool ones that we see right now uh, are these, um, these uh, uh, prairie trillium. So the prairie trillium are blooming right now, and as you can see, they have these beautiful dark red flowers that are very um, different than you normally would think of with these blooms. So uh, with these flowers in particular, you're going to see the carrion beetles. So what does carrion beetle mean? So carrion um, is that that dead, the dead stuff on the side of the road or, or dead animals. So it's these flowers, these dark red flowers are actually going to be emitting not this beautiful floral scent, but this uh, meaty smell uh, that attracts those gnats and those pollinators that are that are not typical that you think of when you think of a pollinator. Those um, those pollinators that are more like butterflies and things. So, um, so these pollinators are actually going to be crawling into this flower here, and they're going to be. Um, uh, taking advantage of that nectar that 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 smells appealing to them which is that that sort of dead smell um, they're going to be taking advantage of those of those flowers so um, very interesting species again so you're gonna have gnats and um, uh, flies and beetles that are gonna be pollinating these guys in particular So flowers have evolved over billions of years to attract those pollinators. It's part of the natural process. So as you can see just behind me, we have our eastern red bud, which has these brilliant pink flowers that are directly attached to the, uh, or that, that are attached very close to the stems. It looks like the, the stems of the trees are just covered in these flowers. But that, that bright color is what attracts the insects to pollinate them, in many cases like the bees and the butterflies. So those brighter colored flowers are the ones that are going to be attracting those butterflies, those bees, um, those shades of yellows, pinks, whites, those brighter colors are what those, those other sort of more traditional pollinators are going to see. So really cool pollination story is the Dutchman's breeches and the queen of the honeybees, I'm sorry, not the honeybees, the bumblebees, the queen of the bumblebees, those big kind of uh, panda bear looking bees uh, that are very well known, um, very docile, uh, pretty much adorable little bumblebees. They're gonna be flying low to these, these forest floors as you can see behind me. Um, right now it's covered in May apple um, and they, they come across the Dutchman's breeches. But the, the bumblebees are the, uh, are one of the only pollinators for the Dutchman's breeches. Um, and one really cool thing about that is that they have the, the ability, because they're such a large bee, they have uh, the, the right uh, physiology to be able to actually uh, pollinate those those flowers properly. So as you can see, the, the flowers are very unique looking. They look, uh, the Dutchman's breeches are um, very much look like uh, uh, old uh, pants, pantaloons as they call them uh, from, from um, uh, 
uh, from Holland uh, hung up on a on a clothesline or something. So as you can see, those that it's a very unique looking flower, and it takes a very unique pollination through this queen bumblebee. So again, she's flying low to the forest floor early on in the spring. She comes across these low lying spring ephemeral flowers, and she comes across this particular plant that really needs her assistance because in order to break through that that pantaloon that you see that flower, um, it requires a long tongue of that of that um, that honey or that bumblebee to be able to actually get into there and they're the only the only bees and the pollinators that are actually strong enough to break that flower open sometimes they'll even use like a a vibration or a humming um, uh, the bumblebee does that can actually open up that flower but the only true pollinator of this of this species uh, is going to be that bumblebee they catch that pollen on themselves and then they bring them to the next the next um, the next flower All right, everybody, I'm really excited to be able to show you this particular plant. Um, it's a plant that is signature at Coffee Creek. Um, many uh, wetland uh, preserves have this species coming up right about this time of the year. So it's about late April right now. Um, and so we're starting to see this plant come up. Um, so I'm actually really excited to be able to show you this one in particular because it has a really fascinating pollination story as well. So um, this is the Jack in the Pulpit. And uh, this is a signature plant, again, in wet areas. Uh, right where we're at right now is actually an old oxbow uh, from the creek so now it's considered an oxbow wetland so it stays stays wet so the creek meandered through here at one point but now has straightened out and passes through here but uh, where we're sitting right now is actually again an old oxbow and so it remains wet it's a low depressed area so these this plant species likes uh, wetter areas in in woodlands in particular um, really cool thing so if you notice that the um, the plant kind of looks almost like a carnivorous pitcher plant that you might see in a bog, uh, but it's actually not. What it is, it's, it's actually a modified leaf that wraps around that stamen, which is that structure through the middle, uh, that reproductive plant structure um, that uh, uh, provides that sort of nectar uh, for the, the insects that pollinate it. And again, you're not going to see uh, birds or butterflies or bees pollinating this particular plant. What's pollinating this plant is actually fungus gnats. So they are attracted to this particular plant. Fungus gnats are attracted to this particular plant because the plant actually emits this sort of fungal smell to it. We can't really smell it, but these fungus gnats are really, uh, really astute to it. So they can smell it. So they're gonna crawl down in here. As you can see, they, cr they crawl down in here and um, they're going to take advantage of that, that, um, that nectar that this plant produces and the sort of sticky sap that's inside. Um, they're going to be eating that, but then uh, in the process, they're going to be kind of crawling down to the bottom and they can't actually crawl back out. So in the male plants, the male uh, the male uh, jack in the pulpits, they actually have a hole down at the bottom that the plants can or that the insects can crawl through. Those fungus gnats can crawl through and get down uh, to the bottom. Of course, forcing them to be able to collect that pollen that, that's down at the bottom. So really, really neat. So so the the plant is actually forcing those gnats to crawl down through the bottom and collect that pollen. And then it, once once it goes to a female plant, it then the the gnats again they're not very smart. So fungus gnats are going to even though they don't they, they it's not a real fungus so they're a little bit they're kind of tricked into going down in there and so the female plants don't actually have that that opening for the um, the gnats to be able to go and escape through so they'll actually um, get stuck in there and they actually end up dying in there as well but they're not consumed they're not digested like in a carnivorous plant they just stay in there um, and they 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 just die along with the plant as well so that's forcing that that insect that was once in a male plant collecting that pollen it then goes to a female plant gets stuck in there and then um, uh, transports that pollen to that that plant so I can't not mention this particular plant so this is a really neat one that we have here at Coffee Creek that's emerging again here late April or so early May um, this is the Canadian lousewort it goes by a couple different common names but that's the one I use most commonly because um, uh, it is a plant that's actually semi-parasitic, um, so it actually means that um, it lives partially, gets part of its nutrients off of being parasitic on other plant roots. So we're seeing it in an area that has a lot of uh, a lot of uh, semi-mature trees. So it's taking the the nutrients from those roots and from those other trees, 
and is actually using those nutrients. Um, but it also does, of course, uh, produce its own nutrients, being a green plant with with uh, chlorophyll. So it is it's a semi-parasitic. It is partly parasitic on other plants. But the reason I mention this, of course, is that it has these beautiful flowers that are very unique um, and has this sort of spirally look to them. And the flowers are longer, so it takes a, a, a bigger pollinator to be able to actually access them. So the bumblebees are going to be the ones that are a little more hulkier, those little sort of flying little giant pandas in the sky kind of thing. They've got the longer tongues to be able to access the nectar that's deeper inside. And they're the ones that are actually going to be pollinating these particular plants. But I couldn't not mention this plant. It's one of my favorites here. And it, it doesn't last for very long here at Coffee Creek, but absolutely love this plant. It's a really neat one.